we're back, and we're back into an online controversy, a brouhaha, as it was called, Pastor John, on September 30th. You tweeted about coffee. You posted Hebrews 12, 28, which says, Let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. And in light of this reverent, awe-filled vision for our worship, you posed this open question, quote, Can we reassess whether Sunday coffee sipping in the sanctuary fits? End quote. As I mentioned last time, the tweet was loved and hated and spread all over the internet to the point that uh, after just a couple of weeks, it had 1,000 retweets, 1,500 comments, 3,000 likes, 2.7 million views on Twitter, and uh, feature articles online from Fox News here in the States and the Daily Mail in the United Kingdom, none of which you saw, which we talked about last time uh, on Monday. Now, there's a lot behind this tweet, uh, a whole worldview, really, and so we are building out the context behind it, and you are talking about how to build and shape a church uh, with this reverential vibe in everything that happens on Sunday morning. Uh, Last time you signaled that you wanted to get into the nitty gritty of helping church leaders really move their church away from casual worship towards something better and more fitting to what Hebrews and really all of the Bible calls for. So get practical for us and pick up the discussion uh, at this point. Yeah, I argued last time that sipping coffee in the holiest hour of congregational worship does not fit with reverence and awe that Hebrews 12, 28 calls for. Uh, Let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, Hebrews says. But I argued sipping coffee is not the heart of the matter. The heart of the matter is that people and leaders don't have a heart that resonates with what I mean by reverence and awe. And the holiness, the sacredness of that hour of congregational worship on Sunday morning, usually. Those realities are not prominent in their mind and heart, those reverent realities. They, They know those words, reverence, awe. They know the words. But the words don't have compelling, existential content with the kind of serious joy that makes people eager for reverence and awe. They're just words. And I argued that you don't solve that problem by creating external rules. You solve it by awakening internal, heartfelt reverence. So things that are unfitting don't get outlawed, they just fall away. Mm. And I think that's, that's the way I tried to do it. I don't think I ever laid down rules for 33 years of preaching. So what I'd like to do here now is to point a way, a possible way forward for pastors to lead the church gradually, say over five to 10 years, got to be patient, mm-hmm. um, from the atmosphere of casual, chipper, coffee-sipping, entertainment-oriented gathering to a more seriously joyful, reverent, deeply satisfying encounter with God. So maybe in, in this episode, Tony, we could talk just for a few minutes about the kind of uh, preaching that would lead in that direction. But maybe before I say that, The pastor's mindset overall is that it's fitting for one hour a week or an hour and a half, it's fitting that the people of God meet him in a kind of radical Godward focus that has weightiness to it and seriousness to it. And that this weightiness and seriousness of God-centeredness become the most satisfying experience in our people's lives. Mm. That's the mindset we've got to have. I want to do this in a way so they love this. They want this. They come for this. This is not tolerated. It's desired. Mm. That's the mindset. We we will never out-entertain the world. Mm. 
They just need to settle that. We'll never out-entertain the world, nor should we try because we have something infinitely better, better, something our souls were made for. And most of our people don't know this. They don't know what's better than the fun they have watching videos and having other kinds of entertainment. They just don't know. They've never tasted Mm. the real thing. Something profoundly stabilizing, strengthening, refining, satisfying at the depths of our being is what people long for, and they don't know what they're longing for until they're shown it over time. So here are five appeals to pastors with regard to preaching. Number one, rivet the people's attention on the Bible, the very words of the Bible. Deal in great realities and show them those realities from the text. Build trust in the Bible, in yourself. Build trust in yourself as a Bible man. We can trust him because he's a Bible man. Some people will leave the church because of this orientation. It's too frightening and threatening to submit to the Bible like this. Others are hungry for this, and they're going to come. Over time, seek to bring into being a people whose mindset is self-consciously and happily under, under the Bible's authority. Seek to create a people who measure everything by the Bible, every thought, every emotion, every word, every action, put through the sieve of Bible teaching, what the Bible really teaches about everything. The way you handle the Bible and the glories you see in it will bring about this kind of congregation. They're not their own. They belong to Christ, and His Word is their life and their law. That's what needs to come into being through your Bible-saturated preaching. Number two, make the glory of God and all that He is for us in Jesus the main reality people sense over years as they hear you preach week in and week out. God is the main reality here. God is big. God is weighty. God is precious. God is satisfying. God is near. Don't mess with God. God loves us. I mean, it's a massive, weighty vision of God. Make the greatness and beauty and worth of God the dominant reality. Be amazed, Pastor. Be amazed at God continually that God simply is, that he just is without beginning. Mm. I mean, this blows the mind of every four-year-old, right? Who made God, Daddy? Nobody made God. Ooh, eyes get big. He just always was there. Absolute reality. All else from galaxies to subatomic particles is secondary. Everything we see is secondary. God is the primary reality. Help your people see this and feel this, that God relates to everything in their lives all the time as the main thing. He is the main thing in their lives. He's the supreme treasure, the main value, the brightest hope, the one they are all willing to live for and die for. Number three, make sure that the ugliness of the disease of sin in us and in the world, and the fury of the wrath of God against that disease are felt by your people. God's grace, precious grace, will never be amazing. Not the way it should be if our people do not tremble at the majesty of God's transcendent purity and holy wrath against sin. If they do not feel the fitness of the outpouring of the cup of the fury of his wrath against sin, they will never be amazed that they're saved. This is one of the main contributors to the happiness of serious reverence. It's paradoxical, I know, Mm that you would have a high, holy, trembling view of God's wrath would be the main contributor to the happiness of the seriousness of reverence. But it is so. The 1,500-degree fire 
of the building from which we have just been snatched by the firemen can still be seen. We see it. We feel it. We see the smoke. We hear the crackle and the trembling of our unspeakably happy thankfulness is anything but casual. Number four, exalt Christ in his majesty and lowliness and in suffering and resurrection and in the unimaginable riches of what he purchased for us. Romans 8, 32, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not with him freely give us all things? Every single good that God's elect receive from now to eternity is owing to the blood of Jesus Christ. Mm. Knowing that I don't deserve this and what it cost him makes me tremble in my ecstasy. And finally, number five. Teach your people the miracle of their own conversion. Nobody knows from experience the glory of the miracle of new birth. We only know the wonder of the new birth from Scripture. When we were dead in our trespasses, God made us alive together with Christ, and raised us up with him, and seated us in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Nobody knows this. Nobody knows this stupendous reality from experience. We know it because God tells us it is so. We have to teach our people that they are supernatural beings. Most people come into the sanctuary feeling very natural, right? Mm -hmm. We have to help them feel you're a miracle. Mm -hmm. You're a walking resurrection from the dead. You're not merely natural anymore. This is not a moment of gathering of natural people. Our faith, which is our life, is a miracle. God created it. It is trust. Our saving faith is trust in a supremely treasured Savior and Lord. So may I venture to say that preaching like this will over time create in your people an eagerness to encounter God in His Word in a way that will make coffee sipping seem out of place. Yeah, powerful appeals to preachers here. Thank you, Pastor John. We'll never out-entertain the world, nor should we try, because we have something infinitely better, and most of our people don't know this. They don't know what's better than the fun they have watching videos and other kinds of entertainment. They just don't know. They've never tasted the real thing. That's sobering and relevant to all Christians and churches who want to cultivate this climate of authentic reverence. We all have a role to play here, uh, down to the coffee that we bring or don't bring with us into the sanctuary, right? That's the point now we see of that tweet. Thank you, Pastor John. So those appeals were mainly to preachers, but what about other cultural changes that can be made on Sundays to shape the reverence of our gatherings? We've talked coffee, we've talked preaching, uh, but now what about dress codes, music, uh, announcements, and all the other factors at play on Sunday mornings? Pastor John will take the discussion up from this point next time. I'm your host, Tony Ranke. We'll see you on Monday.